Welcome to Thriller Bitcoin. Welcome to Thriller Bitcoin. Dude, Love your set, bro. Thank you. I uh, I had a blast hanging out with you last week. Again, yeah, dude, thank you for for really making the event. I had no idea you were gonna go so professional on us, uh, <laughs> but I, I was eagerly like excited to see that, and I I was quite frankly blown away how serious and professional you were when it come to covering a Bitcoin event. I like I was like shocked, but. In like in a in a very like excited happy way because it's good to see somebody who like gives a shit about their craft and what they do mm. and all that stuff. So just want to say thank you for taking it so seriously and really putting some hard earned like passion and work into what you're doing. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I, I um, you know, I think I think uh, you know, you know how, how the artist is, right? Like you, you never you're never satisfied with your work, but. Um, I think, uh, you know, if it's, it's very easy to get pretty, pretty decent coverage of, of events like this. If you, if, you know, if we had prepared a little bit more, I just kind of like, you know, planned it out. We could have had a nice little sort of stage or set and like, but it, I think it's come out well and that uh, we still have a bunch of, we're kind of like slow rolling out the, the interview. So our size hasn't come out yet. And we had a, we got some funny ha- thing happened, um, while we were at Pueblas at the beginning of the, of the event, um, Arc Labs did their first uh, mainnet Arc transaction and Super Testament was part of it. And so he was like, hey, you want to come and film? So I actually got a bunch of footage of that and then did a little interview with Super as well. So we're going to get two sort of medium-sized interviews, like 15-minute interviews or conversations, the one with you and the one with Super. And so I think those will be hot once they come out. They should be coming out in the next few days. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I reached out to Tieto, I think maybe about two months before we did Startup Day to see if he wanted to come out there, but he had some other plans, so right. which is good. It looks like they 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 launched. I need to catch up with all that stuff hopefully this week. Yeah. So just with that, I just wanted to have you on the show because I want to be able to kind of talk about your journey and, and a lot of the stuff that you do, uh, you know. Let's talk about like where you started and like a little bit about who you are and what you do and like why you got in, into this crazy space called yeah. Bitcoin? <laughs> sure, man. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I started I started working in Bitcoin in 2014. I was in in Toronto, and um, I got to see. I, I was a Bitcoiner. I, I became a Bitcoiner because of a libertarian philosopher that was started talking about it really early. But I was like, you know, like a broke kid. I, had, I didn't have any money, so I just I was just learning, right? And then and so I was kind of a Bitcoiner from early on, but but I didn't really enter the industry till like 2014. 
And in Toronto, there was actually a, an incubator called um, Bitcoin Decentral, which was, you know, founded by a Bitcoiner as there was only really Bitcoiners in that era, except there was like crypto was starting to happen, right? So, you know, Litecoin was like a year old or whatever, right? And two years old and, and Namecoin maybe was the thing, but nobody really knew or cared, right? And, and Ethereum was buzzing, but it hadn't even launched yet, right? Like there was, the crypto scene was starting to, to expand, but there was no, like Ethereum hadn't been born yet. So, so I, I started, um, I started volunteering at this incubator, uh, by, and, and it was founded by a guy called Anthony Diorio, which ended up doing really well for himself with Bitcoin. And then, and then with Ethereum, he basically cash flowed the creation of Ethereum up until the ICO. And I think I later on bought like the, like at the top of the, the first or second bull market, he bought the top of, uh, the, like the top penthouse in Toronto, like this guy crushed. Oh, wow. And I mean, that's what happens when you buy the ICO of Ethereum and just YOLO and it's, it's just like complete luck, right? In a sense. But anyway, so I got to see sort of the incubator start, vibe and I got to see, I got to meet Vitalik and a bunch of sort of these sort of OGs and a, bu- a bunch of Bitcoiners as well that are early on. Um, and, and, I, and I was really, really impressed with that, which is why I wanted to come to Play Labs because once I saw... Once I realized that Plebles was a, was an incubator or sort of accelerator, an accelerator, um, you know, I knew that that was a sort of. I've always wanted to return to that kind of uh, environment because I, I think I think it's really important to who you're surrounded with. You know, like like I'm I'm very sort of like whoever I'm talking to, that's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm doing. You know, it's very hard to sort of like remote is powerful. It works, but it's also like you got to be very organized. So. So I like, I like the incubator uh, idea a lot. And, uh, but anyway, so I just start, I started volunteering for them and then I, I started seeing so many cool things that I decided to start writing about them. And I, I, I got eventually like started blogging and then very quickly I got sort of, uh, I ended up getting hired by Bitcoin magazine after like writing a bunch of volunteer articles and stuff. And from Bitcoin magazine, I worked for them for a bit and then for Cointelegraph. And then I started kind of like writing careers sort of doing, let's say crypto and Bitcoin reporting and, and analysis and such. Um, did you enjoy your little, time? Did you enjoy your time with, uh, with coin telegraph and Bitcoin magazine? Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were good. I mean, was, the Bitcoin magazine session was funny cause it was like right around the time that they, they, they sort of restructured and, and were bought out by BTC Inc. Okay. Um, and so I were, I got to work for them for like a month and then the, the business basically shut down for like two months and then rebooted. Right. So in the meantime, I switched to coin telegraph and coin telegraph was pretty solid. It was, it was a weird company. Cause like they, um, I think they're Russian. They're like owned by a Russian sort of, and, uh, but they were very solid, you know, like you, they just paid per view and, and they had some minimums and some bonuses. So every once in a while, if I had a hit, I got like a big bonus. And to me, that was a big deal. So, um, nice. so then, yeah. So then I just, I kind of moved to Mexico just to like avoid the winter because I was in Canada. And then I just started creating content and doing crypto work from, uh, from, from Mexico. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a long journey, you know, I've done a lot of things, but, uh, that's kind of how I, how I got into this whole industry. That's wild. Um, yeah, for the people that, that might not know, or just jumping in and listening to this, uh, Juan came down to startup day and, uh, it was interesting the way the way uh, Super had messaged me maybe like two weeks before. And he's like, hey, I want to bring my friend uh, something, something. I don't remember the exact words. And usually I don't give out press passes like that's something that I just don't do just because I never see any value from it. But uh, I think I messaged you and I was like, well, if Super OK, you then it's OK, because like Super <laughs> won't befriend somebody that's a jerk, you know. And right. so that's why I, I was like, OK, cool. And then when you came and you did all these things, I was like wow. Like <laughs> I felt so bad after it. I was like, man, I should have just said yes. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I think your ask was fair. We, you know, we put out that press release and pumped a little bit. In fact, I think for future events, if you want, we can probably just prep a little bit more and, and give yeah. you guys more airtime, right? At BitcoinNews.com is very, very organized. And uh, I would have had you as a moderator. I would have had mm-hmm. you as a moderator. I didn't even know. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I wish, uh, yeah, next time we'll, we'll do fun. it. We'll do it right. And we'll, we'll get good. you, we'll get you some, some coverage there too on the front stage. But sure. uh, yeah. So talk about, let's talk about like where you see like this, this space has come to, cause you've been around for a long time. Do you think we're at a point now where, we kind of lost one. Did we lose? Did we lose Number the here. overarching mis- mission for Bitcoin? That's a good question. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, I don't think we've lost it. I think, I think the issue is that 
people did not have a very, let's say, sound expectations of, of what success was going to look like. You know, so so when I when I got into this, everybody was an anarchist or a lot of people were anarchists or very like deep libertarians. And there was this, for example, there's this like very strong sort of resistance or critique of banks, which is a funny thing, because if you're a bunch of anarcho capitalists, you know, you should understand that capital like capitalism requires capital and banks are traditionally in classically investment sort of like bad vehicles, right? They're the ones that allocate the capital and judge the quality and take the risk. And so you kind of need some sort of banking like system. And so, so, but, but, you know, people, this was like in the era of Occupy Wall Street and like, mm-hmm. you know, there was a kind of like, like we were all in this sort of this left, like economic analysis sort of paradigm, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, we, this people didn't really think they, they thought that Bitcoin was going to take down the banks and then there was this sort of cypherpunk utopian uh, vision that the government was just going to collapse, right? Like ANCAP dream, <laughs> uh, the government was just going to collapse and everybody's going to be Bitcoinized and there's no, nobody was going to put up a fight, right? And I think I just, for, uh, over time, I started realizing that that was just just wishful thinking, you know? Like you, I think, and I started asking people, so what do you, what do you think success looks like? And nobody really gave me a good answer. And so I realized, okay, the ETF is part of the success story, right? Like, because ETF is the infiltration that it's Bitcoin. No, can you get down and breaking through the door of Wall Street and, you know, opening the gates to that, right? And then the other, the other mode that the financial world has is the sort of uh, the getting banks to custody and, and deal in, in, let's say, in Bitcoin accounts, Bitcoin denominated accounts and, and custodying funds. And, you know, again, like I'm a self-custody maximalist. I don't, you know, I barely even use KYC exchanges or anything like that. I, do, I avoid them like, I, like the plague. But I think the reality is most people are just going to use that because it's easy and they're lazy and, and a lot of them are technically literate. And so just, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a generational transition for self-custody to scale culturally, even if it can scale technologically, right, which is a separate question. So Interesting, yeah. So, you know, so, so I think the, the banks getting, being able to custody and deal in Bitcoin accounts, that's another mode. And the third mode I, I, I see is like the payment uh, processing sort of machines that were, I, I believe they used to be like, they used to have like proprietary firmware and like be legally very tied down. And apparently that started to break down over years. So like Bitcoin and, and crypto startups are be, are starting to be able to kind of like get in those machines. That's the third boat. And so I think that those modes are sort of cracking and that's, that's very good. But then, but then you have these sort of anarchists, you know, that like look at this and say, are we failing? Are we failing because we're winning? You know, like mm. we're part of, we're the establishment now. This is a victory. It's like, what did you, what did you think victory was going to be? You know, Interesting. like you think, just like banks are going to disappear and then like everybody's going to be a crypto anarchist, you know, with multi-sig wallets, right? Like, I, I think, I think that's part of the, part of the, the, the issue there. Interesting. That's a, that's a great way to put it. So let me push back a little bit because I want to hear your thoughts on, so like hypothetically, if we do get this ETF and, and we do get some of these other things and these are kind of what ifs, right? Like, do you think there's a potential that, it, you know, th- there's a there's a fork or or some sort of uh, monopolization that happens to the to the ecosystem where it just becomes captured in, in a lot of ways. Or do you think those cypherpunk ideals can still uh, withstand something like a uh, like a BlackRock or J.P. Morgan or some of these other big conglomerates? Yeah, no, that's another great question. I think so. I mean, the, the ETFs already happened um, and they happened at least they're, they're settled in a cash basis, but they're, they're effectively like Bitcoin collateralized. They're supposed to be full reserve. Um, the, the thought that just came out down with uh, Coinbase and like, you know, selling paper Bitcoin, apparently they're settling now every 12 hours. So like, that's pretty good for a, a Bitcoin integration of, of a fiat institution, right? Like they, they, there's a lot of paper pushing you got to do probably. So um, I am, uh, I'm not terribly concerned about that. And I'm not concerned for a couple of reasons. I think this sort of this fear that the, the Wall Street is going to manipulate the price of, of Bitcoin is actually like an echo of the gold bugs. And the gold bugs sort of were, let's say, this 
like frustrated with the lack of movement in gold. They estimated it should be like what ten grand, you know, years ago, and and they said it was because uh, J.P. Morgan and 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 a few like a, like a few other big banks were manipulating the gold price. And there was like actual apparently actual cases that revealed that they were indeed manipulating. Then people sort of got. Like there was cases against them and prosecutions, I believe, or people fired, et cetera. So there's a scandal there for sure. But, but one of the differences between gold and Bitcoin is that you can, in a bull market, gold production escalates and supply increases. And that supply is controlled by a bunch of corporations that are public companies in Wall Street, probably. And so they have connections. And so they grab the supply and they sell it directly to the banks. So the banks can sort of you know, cover their leverage and short paper, right? So they can hedge their, their operation with the new supply. You can't really do that with Bitcoin. The price goes up, the mining supply is constant and the same, doesn't increase. Uh, it's not an elastic commodity like 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 every other commodity in the world, right? It's actually, you know, uh, true scarcity in a sense, right? And And I think that's the first thing that differentiates us from gold and that can protect us from this because if if... If Wall Street, if, if BlackRock wanted to manipulate the price and they started to like short sell paper Bitcoin, they're just exposed to a viral sort of GameStop like move. And unlike GameStop, where they did it as well, there's no CEO that can print stock and dump in the price and dampen the pump. Right. On the contrary, they're just they're basically like exposing themselves to a bull run. And then if they get caught on the wrong side of that trade, they can get liquidated or they can get hurt, like wounded badly. Right. And and I think I think the BlackRock people uh, might be you know smart enough to see this. I mean they probably are you know, and I think they're also against the wall on other areas, right? Because the fiat world is shaky, right? The 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 bond market is sketch, you know. The the inflation in the U.S. is increasing, you know. The the era of of the petrodollar has effectively ended, you know. And they just you know the the the, the powers that be haven't really kind of integ- integrated that reality, right? Like it's, uh, it, you know, Saudi Arabia is selling oil for yawn and stuff, right? So um, I think I think sort of the, 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 the powers of being in the U.S. Are, are sort of in a difficult situation, you know? And so, so I'm not sure that they can, they can mess it up. But, you know, at the end of the day, like if all the supply or most of the supply concentrated on, on exchanges – and then the government did like a fifty-one, like a like a like a gold confiscation style attack. Uh, yeah, they could definitely destroy Bitcoin. So like, <laughs> you know, like we don't want all the supply to be there, right? Um, yeah. So I think I think our job is like as as sort of purists, our job is to make it easy to for people to like exit the 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 banking mode and take self custody. And the good news is the distribution of of coins it does show the withdrawal from exchanges. Yeah, there's been like a concentration into ETFs, but there's also like the amount of self custody has probably increased uh, over the years uh, steadily. So I think that's the game. You know, I think our job is to make sure that there's always a hole in the in the walled garden. You know. Yeah. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense actually. Because I, I guess we are seeing like these hodl waves are taking place, right? Where more and more people are self custody, and I think if if that kind of plays out against this kind of back black rock backdrop, then at some point um, they won't have a move to make potentially. I don't know. I don't know how much Bitcoin is actually funneling through these, uh, these, uh, these uh, conglomerate financial conglomerates, but uh, it, it, it does, it does get you on a, I mean, just me as a pleb, just trying to think through the, the like um, game theory of it all. It just, it, to me, it just seems inevitable at some point us having a fork off mm-hmm. of whatever they're doing at some point, mm-hmm. or even them forking, Right. for us and creating some like proof of stake version of Bitcoin. They could try. It's going to be an airdrop. It's going to be great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not worried about it. Oh, you know, okay. like they could try. The, the worst thing you can do in a fork is, is sell the wrong side of the fork. Right. So most likely scenario, they fork it, they see the fork fail, they keep the Bitcoin and whoever is arrogant enough to think they can, they can succeed at the fork. They, they they're taking a big risk, you know. So so may, so maybe so maybe at some point BlackRock, Coinbase, and some of these other traditional f- uh, finance uh, uh, conglomerates uh, fork Bitcoin, and they just ha- and that's an airdrop to the plebs, I guess. It's kind of what we're yeah. Saying. Well, I think the fork the, the fork politics are are really interesting because um, 
<laughs> so on the one hand, we have a bunch of people saying that Bitcoin is ossified. And then there's people that there's the people that want it to ossify. There's the people that are like tacitly accepting ossification or, or, or seeing ossification. And on the other hand, you have people who want to change it. And of those that want to change it, you have people that want to change it because they want to turn it into Ethereum. And then there's people who want to change it because they want to upgrade it. And I think that's where, at least that's, that's where I'm in. Like, I think we're the good guys. It's like, we want to, like, I want CTV. I want, uh, I want covenants of some sort. I want to be able to do slightly more sophisticated smart contracts. You know, like, like I think, I think when people ask me, oh, well, what have shitcoins done ever that is uh, an interesting feature? It's like, actually, Tornado Cash. Okay. So the, the developers of Tornado Cash are in prison or were like arrested, and Tornado Cash still works. Okay. You can't say that of Samurai. You can't say that of Wasabi. You can't even say that of Joint Market. I mean, Joint Market doesn't have a, Joint Market is, there's no point to attacks. Joint Market is very cool, but, but Tornado Cash works, still works. You can still move money to Tornado Cash, right? Why? Because it's being executed on, on this EVM and there's no keys and, you know, it just works. So I think, I think if we could achieve a little bit more of that, that'd be, that'd be cool. But, you know, there's all these other potential risks and stuff. So I, I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of CTV. I think, I think, it would solve a lot of problems with with um, with lighting. I think I think it would grant us better self custody tools. Um, you know, like uh, just to give you one self custody example of why this is a good thing. Um, every time you move your Bitcoin, let's say you have a multi sig and you're moving, you know, your your hold hold back, you're going to spend one percent of your of your deep cold storage Bitcoin, right? Yeah. You're actually moving a hundred percent of your Bitcoin. It's just that only 1% is going to somebody else and the rest is returning to you. But that means that during the moment of that transaction, 100% of your Bitcoin is at risk of being sent to the wrong address or the keys, I don't know, being exposed or something like that. So with, 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 a, with a covenant vault, what you can do is you can say, well, this cold storage Bitcoin can only spend to these addresses or this address first and... And there's no other place it can go, right? And so it lets you sort of control that. And then I think with a little bit more functionality, we could say, you know, only, um, you know, only a certain percentage can move or like, you know, like you can, you can structure self custody a little bit better. And I think I wish I had a more clear example, but I think that's, that's, that was a really interesting, like flashpoint for me on, 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 on the risk of self custody and how we've sort of my guy ever this multi six stuff. Um, so anyway, so, so I think that's where we're at now. The issue is there's a, apparently there's a, there's a hard fork that's kind of necessary in like 2034 or 36 or something like that. There's some bug that has like a, a some sort of timer on it. And then it's going to basically go boom in like 36. So if we don't, if we don't soft fork peacefully now, there's going to be a war in 10 years. Right. And, and I think that's what I'm starting to realize is like, I think we're better off dealing with this stuff now so that we can have a very smooth upgrade then. But, um, but you know, I don't know, maybe they'll figure out a hacky way to solve that too. So, I mean, I, that's where I'm at. I don't know if, I don't know if a soft work is going to happen. I'll tell you if there is a soft work, there's going to be, there's going to be a war because there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that want it, want us, want us off work. And there's a lot of different interests that want different things. Yeah. Um, however, I think, I think there's a general coalition towards, you know what, we can probably find a very reasonable upgrade that solves most of people, most people's sort of software problems with Bitcoin without breaking it. And there's been really good research into why, let's say, uh, Mevil or EVM type, atta type attacks are not really doable in Bitcoin. It has to do with being a UTXO model instead of an account model, et cetera. So I don't know. I think, uh, I think it would, <laughs> I'm, I'm open to it. I'm just here for the ride, you know, like <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I think that makes sense. I think the, uh, I think for me, I feel like there's like this overarching article that needs to be written where it, it you know, it places the miners, the clubs, the devs, mm. institutional players, the, the sovereign wealth funds, the VCs. And it just has like this whole, and it shows their incentives for these soft works or um, what, whatever they are. And it shows what each one gets out of it. Right. I think mm -hmm. what, what you mentioned was the whole right. UTXO management. To me, that seems like a pleb thing that I definitely want. I can get on board with that. Yeah. Or maybe I can't get on board if it, you know, if it makes shit coins mm -hmm. <laughs> easier or there introduces some new bug. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there just needs to be somebody who creates this kind of like a, 
Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to explain yeah. it from my head, but I feel like there, there could be a, yeah. there could be an overarching article there that really, that really could dive into what each, cause that's what we are. We're a group of, uh, different self-interested, uh, groups, um, mm-hmm. vying together to move this thing forward. But, uh, we all are doing it because of the incentives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, I think, um, there's, you know, there's certain people that are like kind of reactionary, right? They, they sort of, they oppose something out of association. Oh, these guys are shit corners. Therefore what the technology they're pushing is bad. Um, you know, it's so let's say there's a lot of critique from, let's say the harder Bitcoin maximalist sort of crowd too, against like the opcat sort of Ethereum adjacent sort of crowd. But like actually opcat is being pushed by blockstream, you know, like, uh, their main researcher is pro opcat and like a bunch of blockstream people like opcat because it's like very mediocre middle, middle ground, but also like very powerful. And also they've, there's been a lot of research into it in the past few months. And, and so it would let them hack their way to uh, solving a bunch of problems that would let you prove use cases for more optimized, more specialized opcodes. And so when, you know, when you have up, when you have blockstream and the crypto cats people, you know, on the same team, and then you have this sort of also five Bitcoin maximalists over here. I, you know, it's hard. It's confusing, right? Like the, the alliances don't make sense, right? Politics makes weird bedfellows of sorts, right? That's the saying. So I think, I think eventually, sort of some compromise or some alliance, some sort of coalition will form. I think some of the good ones are uh, Ellen Hans, which was done by Reardon, uh, who is uh, you know ex Bitco. Uh, engineer he's very very good and it's a combination of like ctv and a couple of other up codes that doesn't have up cat but it solves a bunch of problems right and then the other one is uh, rusty russell's uh great script restoration that to me is the most exciting i think that would be great um there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that like cleanup work that needs to be done there's a great consensus cleanup which peter todd uh put i think in you know very front and center in the developer community with, with his analysis of softworks recently. And it's just like, there's a bunch of cleanup work that needs to be done on the consensus code that you, we should probably do first and then do an upgrade. So, you know, I think ossification would be, I don't know if ossification really works because of the bug that the 2036 bug or whatever, but um, it would be great if we could just, you know, push something through, but I mean, I don't know, you know, Bitcoin is wild. So, um, you kind of have to, you, you kind of have to walk a very fine line, you know? Um, yeah, it, it's, it, this is where like the, your reputation does matter. Um, in, in what you've done in the past and how people perceive you and, uh, whether you say crazy things online or not. And, uh, I know Peter Todd said some crazy things online this past week. <laughs> uh, and then, but at the end of the day, everybody knows he's brilliant with mm-hmm. what he does too. So it's, it really is, uh, it, it really does come down to like, what, what are you advocating for? Like me personally, I always advocate for startups and builders and people like that and making sure they have grants and support and those type of things. So, but if I went in and joined in on this whole covenant discussion, people were like, get out of here, man, stay in your lane. <laughs> so you know what I mean? So I just kind of, always just try to stay in my lane with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I get it. I think, yeah, I think it's a matter of just like spreading the conversation. I think a conversation is worth having. I think, um, at some point, like the developer community, as far as I can tell, like there's a pretty deep recognition that this would be better tools to have. It's just, nobody has a pulse to sort of plant the flag there and, and put their name on it. Right. Yeah. Um, but I maybe at some point somebody will, you know, and then I guess yeah. we'll see what happens. I mean, cause like when I see it from like the startup, space and the ecosystem like well we have a lot of these apis that can give us liquidity mm-hmm. into the lightning network and uh, you know mm-hmm. there is there's breeze there's strike mm-hmm. there is uh zebedee um there are these options already um, mm-hmm. for a lot of this stuff so um but then uh, you know you talk to somebody like keon who's going like the full self-custodial model he'll talk about like the lack of or having to do channel management and how much of a pain in the ass it is and how potentially some of these things that you're talking about could help with that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, yeah. it's, it's a weird uh, give and take. Yeah. And, and it's a question of, of, um, interest as well and, and, and value. So, so another conversation that I've been having with people is, um, you know, 
there's two general groups, right? There's like the plebs, crypto anarchists or cypherpunky type people. And then there's the finance people, right? And the finance Bitcoiners, you know, are would be like sailor and, you know, everybody that's like talking macro, right? And then the, the cypherpunk types are like anybody that's interested in self-custody and, and, and like, you know, like from lop down, right? Let's say, right? And um, I think... I think there's sort of going to be a, an interesting, let's say, culture clash between those two potentially in the next soft fork because Sailor doesn't want soft forks because that that feels risky to him, you know, and he he doesn't he feels like that. I think I think at, a, at an optics level, he sees that as like it might be perceived as Bitcoin is upgradable and therefore it's changeable and therefore it's not digital gold and therefore, right? Like, I think there's sort of, that's kind of one of the ideas that makes him resistant to it. Um, but I don't know, like, I think he just finds it uncomfortable and I think he's gonna, I think he's gonna find a lot of uh, pushback or resistance against that, you know? Um, and and then, but the other side is the, the self-custody crowd and the self-custody crowd is kind of in a funny position because because if if we don't find a way to scale self custody, like if we don't find better tools, like right now with Arc and Lightning, you can scale self custody, let's say a hundred x, right? But that's still far away from probably the thousand or ten thousand x we need in order to reach the whole world and give the whole world self custody. Um, and so we kind of need, like, we could we would benefit from from better scripting to do like, you know more scalable self-custody stuff without doing a, a, a like a block size increase which is still very unpalatable and you know i don't i don't really care for a block size increase i think we need better technologies right so um you know so so i think i think that's one issue but the, the, the other funny side is that you know the fees are three like three satoshis provide right so like where's the where's the where's the price action and the adoption that's gonna out price self-custody right like the concern is that it becomes so expensive to move money on chain that you're going to have to use sort of more complex self custody models like arc or lightning and stuff to move money and then only settle in an emergency. And then, and, and so, and then the issue the, the reason CTV is important is because you can anchor your withdrawal transaction to a certain fee price and not get sort of rugged by a, a spike in, in, in fees, right? So if you're just as transaction, the thing that saves you from being robbed in the Lightning Network, uh, if, if that transaction doesn't get settled fast enough, you're, you're, really, you're in serious trouble. And so CTV lets you anchor that and make sure that gets through um, in a way that, that Lightning doesn't, doesn't really have a good answer to right now. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think, I think, I think we're going to see uh, a tension there. And so the, the sailor answer is, well, you know, just put it on Coinbase, right? <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, oh, I, no, right? I, I think the I think the interesting thing there, and I have a couple points so, uh, to answer on some of those things, but I think the way Sailor sees it is kind of like, he sees it as, as like property, right? I think that's how he's described it before, as like the best property in the world. And I, whenever I hear him say that, to me, it's just like, sure, it could be the best island in the world, but if there's no one there's no value there. Uh, and this might be like out of turn saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, but like even America, right? Like America was, was founded by uh, people from Europe that came over. The Indians were sitting on some great land, but was it actually being used to its, to its, uh, you know, uh, to its possibilities? Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. and now you, you look at it and now the, the America is being used, uh, or at least depending on who you ask it's being used to, to make all sorts of riches so to me right. when i when i when he says this island it's like sure you're gonna have the great best island in the world but like is anybody like is the valley gonna go up just because it's just sitting there i don't see it going up if you're just holding, right. it, holding it um sure there's right. scarcity in, in in that model and uh going slow and steady but i think it i think the value of it goes a lot higher if there's more people needing it to, for different reasons right uh, mm -hmm. which is why we saw gold go up in value whether it was through trade or through use cases in technology or just jewelry or other things like that but what's mm -hmm. really cool about bitcoin is it's it's on the internet and it's the internet's money and uh, it can be used for all sorts of things like automation and ai and mm -hmm. uh, also what he's talking about digital property um, mm -hmm. so to me whenever he says that it's just like no that's just like one aspect maybe it's the best aspect 
to him, but to me, it's just like one, uh, it's just like saying, oh, the internet was great just for email and that's why we should have the internet. And sure, it's great for email, but that's just one of the many possibilities that the internet brought us. So mm-hmm. anyways, that's just kind of how I see it with, with his stuff. Yeah, no, I think, I think that that brings another very interesting, um, let's say dichotomy within the Bitcoin world. Um, and Obi from uh, Fetty Mint did an interview with, I believe was uh, Matt Adele and uh, on the TFTC, I think. And I thought he, and Bobby had a fantastic analysis of this. I was really, really, uh, let's say, uh, inspired by it, or at least, you know, it, really impressed by it. So what he said was there's basically like two types of users, which we I think we know. There's the people that are the, that spend the Bitcoin and like to spend the Bitcoin, and there's the people that like to hodl the Bitcoin. And these two type of users are are two type that they're in different stages of their life in a sense. So the hodlers are people that have excess capital that are often in North America or upper middle class in their countries. They have excess capital, so they can invest in something, but they don't need spending because they have access to the best financial services in the world. They have banks and credit cards and payment apps and you know american bank accounts and everything right they have all the all the all the legacy finance stuff that's already installed into everything they don't care about the fees they don't care about the kyc well i mean i think self custody like there's you know within that group there's like hodlers that are very right. sort of privacy oriented right but like i think as a whole it's like you know what they don't there's a lot of a lot of the hodl crowd are like this is my bitcoin bag this is separated and then i i do my fiat mining job or whatever and, and, and I don't really spend the Bitcoin because there's also nowhere to spend it anyway, right? Kind of thing, right? And then there's the people that actually don't, like the, the global South, uh, you know, Latin America type sort of side of the world, which they don't have excess capital. They're often like living day to day. They're, they're, you know, they're making like very little money, right? Like, uh, you know, if you're making $500 a month in Latin America, you're not doing too bad, right? And on average, right? And so um, for them to like save in Bitcoin, right? Like what, think about this. I was thinking about a, a, a DCA like app, right? And it's like in Latin Latin America, it's like how much can the average Latin American actually DCA, right? So you're making 500 bucks a month of which you're spending $400 a month. So you got $100 a month left. And then if I tell you, am I going to tell you, go like drop those hundred dollars, drop 10, 20% of your wealth a month into Bitcoin and have nothing left to like enjoy life or whatever, right? Like just enjoy looking at your Bitcoin. It's like, no, I would never advise that as like, if I was a financial advisor, I would never tell somebody like go all in with your excess capital into Bitcoin and YOLO it because I understand the the volatility, even though I did it when I was a kid, I fucking went all in. So... (laughs) It's like I like I did it, but I, I don't know if you should, you know. So I would say like maybe go in with ten or twenty percent of your excess capital into Bitcoin. Do that, DCA in. Okay, so now we're talking about twenty dollars a month, right? Like that's and then how much is the fee? Well, the fee is like in the in the best case scenario, twenty five cents, right? Um, which is now what? That's like we're talking about one percent of of your of your DCA stack a month. Or with lightning, I mean, it would be, it could be potentially lower, but I mean, it's probably not going to be a lot lower than that. And so if the fees go up, they're, they're not in the game. You know, if the fees go up to $10, they're out, you know? And so I think, I think that that's, that's sort of the issue, right? Like those people have very different perspective and immediate interests than the hodlers. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so, and, the, and so, so, so I think the the sort of global South crowd, they and they're all the global South crowd doesn't have access to dollars. That's the other thing. They have access to like really cr- trashy local currencies, right? And so they actually want to stay in Bitcoin because they see much bigger upside. Yeah. And the exchange rate is going to screw them. So I think I think we're talking about two different audiences in this in this debate and. Um, I personally like both. I think, I think, I think we need much better solutions for the global South. I live in the global South. I think it's great, you know, but I also like hodling. I think, I think, I think we need very good hodl technology. So, uh, I do agree. We need both. And if it becomes just like a, a thing in banks, you know, it's like, I guess that could work, but ah, you know, 
This is going to become another fiat currency. I don't know. I think the other th- and you said that Obi said this. I, th- I think the thing that he misses here is um, there's a third audience to that. And uh, I would say that's the people that are making the Bitcoin, like the people that are actually uh, have a business or the people that are doing these startups or, or these builders who are building these these passive sat flow businesses. Um, because those people, like, they're not just hodling. Maybe they're hodling, you know, on in, on their on their balance sheet of a sort. But um, that's a whole other side to this equation. That if you if you if you have the mind of sailor, yeah, it makes sense. If you have fiat, a bunch of fiat, then you want to move over to Bitcoin. That makes sense. But uh, what happens when uh, you're you're the best? Um, I don't know. Let's say uh, gaming company, and you're making boatloads of Bitcoin. Then it you look kind of stupid just holding holding it leaving there uh, just sitting on on a on a um, on a balance sheet not doing anything right because this other guy is just like outselling you and he's making more Bitcoin by the day and he's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger to me that's that's the other that's a third audience I think they're failing to see but I, I think I think I think America will come around to that because I do think we're headed to a very soon point here in America where people are just not going to take your dollars. They're going to want Bitcoin instead. And I think Latin America is so far ahead in that respect where they just, they, there's not going to be a, a, a moving over because they're already doing it, right? They're already living their day to day with using Bitcoin. And that's why you see El Salvador doing really great things over there is because they're already living that life to a certain extent, even if they're not entirely all in Bitcoin, but it's going to be a harder switch for Americans to to understand why their dollars aren't worth anything from one day to the next and why people, especially here in Texas and Austin are going to say no to your fiat (laughs) and they're going to want Bitcoin. Like, I don't think that's going to be a route. I think that day is going to come at some point, at least in my lifetime. And when it does, I'm just going to be like, well, told you. (laughs) It's not even, I told you it's going to be like, uh, I don't know what to do. Like, uh, you know, there's just, why would I take your dollars when I can, when they're being burned, you know, for heat. Uh, and I think that's, that's the, that's the cold reality that Americans don't want to face. I, I think they're comfortable saying these things on stages and, but they don't, they don't really know. You okay over there? Okay. I, I think that's the cold reality. Like where, when I talk to my community and the people that I'm around, we all get that. Mm-hmm. Uh, about making making sats flow and making revenue and stuff like that, but uh, they, I don't know if I don't know if there's too many Americans that think that way. I think they're comfortable with living in their dollar and their fiat uh, life and stuff like that, but they don't realize that that day's slowly coming to an end. Yeah, no, I, I think so. You, you said two really interesting things. Uh, one one is that um, you're right. There is a third crowd, and there's that that crowd is the crowd that earns in Bitcoin. Uh, I've been part of that crowd for a long time. Uh, most of the Bitcoin that I own, which is not much, but most of the one, the coin that I own is the one that I've earned, right? And I've earned it working, I've earned it trading, I've earned it in the industry. Uh, I've bought very little of it. So I think I think there's, there is like a crowd of those people, right? And they, to me, I consider them like the, the, the sort of fountain of Bitcoin, right? Like we are the distributors of it because we actually end up spending it. We have to end up moving it because we have to pay our bills and such. And so I think that's actually a really interesting crowd. Uh, I think it's the most important crowd. One of the issues that is the most important from the adoption and hyper Bitcoinization perspective, because one of the issues with, with let's say, uh, payments adoption of Bitcoin is that nobody has Bitcoin. Like maybe 1%, maybe 1% of the world has Bitcoin, maybe, right? Probably not. Probably like 0.1% of it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe half a percentage of people have Bitcoin. That's not enough. It's not enough to to create a flywheel of price of, of, of merchant adoption such that you can go to any restaurant and pay. So you, you end up having these middleman sort of settling settlement institutions that convert to fiat to pay whoever you gotta pay. And and then you also end up with very little Bitcoin adoption or, or pay, payments coming into merchants and so they don't end up, you know, it doesn't stick. You know, doesn't get doesn't stick. I think there's other ways to make it sticky. I think we gotta get merchants into DCA. Then we gotta I think we gotta apply the sailor strategy. You know, I kinda like maybe came off as sort of being critical sailor. Actually I have criticisms of it, but I actually really like a lot of what he's done. I think his his idea of like here's a corporate strategy for businesses at every level of the stack and how you can 
have a Bitcoin treasury. I think if we can, if we come up to a business and we say, hey, here's our payments app, so you can take Bitcoin, we'll do marketing for you. And here's your DCA corporate strategy playbook, and we'll sell you DCA Bitcoin so you can have a Bitcoin treasury, you know, and just put five to ten percent of your excess capital into it or whatever. I think now you now that might be stickier, right? Because in my experience, retail is very difficult to 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 like like I've onboarded merchants throughout my career, multiple merchants, and it doesn't stick because because nobody shows up and so they forget and, and somebody else has the Bitcoin phone. So you need like a better app, you know. You need a better app for Bitcoin. You need to an app that integrates into their system, etc. So anyway, so so I think. So I think that that you're right. Like the 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 people that earn the Bitcoin, they need to distribute it, and 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 that and that's part of the process. And um, I, I I agree that's a third uh, crowd. What I don't agree with actually is I think that the path of the dollar. I think it has another twenty years at least. And I think what we've seen in Latin America is not really that much Bitcoin adoption. Like Bitcoin has Bitcoin broke through the gates. And, you know, it got a wave of adoption in, in Venezuela and El Salvador it opened it up and Argentina has been playing with Bitcoin for a long time. But actually, other cryptos actually took a big piece of that. And for the most part, it's actually just Tether. Like USDT on 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 Tron is the, the bee's knees in Latin America, right? All over the, the global south is USDT on Tron. Why? Because people have debts in dollars. People think and calculate value in dollars. Uh, the dollar is considered the benchmark and the unit of account, so it's considered stable, has this illusion of stability. And even though in the United States the inflation is visible, right, like yeah. shockingly visible, it's still a better currency than the Colombian peso and the Venezuelan peso for sure. It doesn't even exist basically anymore. Like Venezuela is basically dollarized, right? The Argentinian peso has stabilized thanks to Malay, but if he if he wasn't around, it would continue to nosedive against the dollar, despite the, the dollar nosediving against that goods, right? And so like all fiat currencies suck, the dollar sucks the least, and the crypto dollar, right? The, the, the tethers, you know, of the world, that is, actually one of the killer apps, right? Like Tether is making more money than BlackRock. They're, 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 they're grabbing people's cash deposits into their, I don't know, network of banking partners and they're buying treasuries and they're getting 5% short-term yield on that and they're making more money than BlackRock, right? And so now they, they are the, they're the new BlackRock, right? And, and so I think Tether is actually a shockingly fascinating story. And I think, I think, what we need is Tether on top of Bitcoin apps, right? So I'm actually a big fan of, of the idea of, from Lightning Labs of getting Tether running at, across the Lightning Network because I don't want it on Tron. I don't, Tron should not be, not be in the picture. There should be no shitcoin Tron in the middle. You know, Tron is centralized as hell. Nobody cares, but they use Tron because it's perceived as cheap and fast. And it's actually not that cheap. Lightning is cheaper. And it's not that fast. Lightning is faster. Well, tr- well, Tron is communism, isn't it? Isn't Justin Sun the CEO of of that yeah. com- of that communistic coin? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so Justin Sun is uh, Chinese. Uh, he's probably part of the CCP. He's back. He's back by the by communism, isn't he? By China. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, if you're Chinese, you have to be right. And and also, like one of the reasons I think Tron managed to grab this tether market is because they partnered up with the right people in the east right so i'll tell you a cool story about about yeah. how tether is used in colombia just so you get a sense of the depth yeah, yeah. of this right so i went to a, a conference a bitcoin conference um yeah bitcoin crypto shitcoin conference i was invited to in colombia in cucuta cucuta is like the tijuana of colombia it's like the biggest border town and it's bordered with venezuela now venezuela is a huge great black market because it's like a failed state with deep ties to the East, right? And so every once in a while, you get really weird goods. You get tons of cheap gold, you get tons of cheap euros, right? You get all kinds of crazy stuff moving through Cucuta, right? And one of the things that's happened is that a lot of that stuff is trading against Tether. So there's like, there's money exchange businesses in Cucuta that buy, sell gold, dollars, euro, against Tether 
and against the peso. So the usual app, they have the Tether logo and, and, and you can trade against them. Now you go to Bogota and there's other exchange markets deep in Bogota. And they also have the Tether logo. It's like, okay. And what happens is that the Bogota is like the major capital of like retail goods. Um, you know, you have a bunch of retailers that are selling you random Chinese crap and they grab all the pesos and they go to this sort of exchange places and they're like, here, I have a bunch of pesos converted into Tether, into do- crypto dollars, Tether dollars, and send it to this address. And this address is a bank in Taiwan, no, or I think it's Taiwan or Thailand, in Thailand. And, and the Thailand banks grab the Tether, flip it for yuan, launder the accounting, and then so pay the Chinese suppliers. And then within a day, there's new supplies coming in. So they cut the, the finance cycle from 30 days to one day thanks to Tether, right? And Tether was, was born out of Bitcoin, right? Like Tether was originally launched on Bitcoin, right? So I, I think that's pretty deep integration. Um, and I think, I, I, I wish that was happening on top of Bitcoin, right? And if it was happening on top of Bitcoin, when the dollar collapses, they're gonna, people are going to have this wallet installed that's just going to have like a little Bitcoin logo, annoying them to DCA in, you know? And like, it's going to be an easy switch. But if it's Tron, maybe they, you know, maybe we have to, it's just going to be Tron the one that takes that market. So <laughs> do they, do they have, do they have the option of getting sats instead? Or is it only Tether that they can get? They can get sat. I mean, they can get Bitcoin here. I mean, there's, there's a deep peer to peer market. That's like very crypto pragmatic, you know, like they'll sell you whatever you want. They'll buy whatever you want. They'll take their 5% commission, you know, <laughs> like they don't care. Right. Like they're, they're like a lot of Latin Americans are gray hats, you know, like we're just fucking like, we're just, we're just making our, our bread. Right. Um, so I think, but yeah, the Bitcoin is, I mean, there is a Bitcoin maximalist community in Colombia um, and they're great people. And I think there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's, there's deep roots, but then there's a bunch of crypto people as well. And there's a, again, a deep peer to peer market. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's wild to me, Juan, cause when, when I, what I see here in Austin is I see a lot of like circular economy stuff. So I see a lot of people just paying in Bitcoin, doing just peer to peer Bitcoin transactions and stuff like that. And it's fantastic, right? You can pay for your beef this way. You can pay for your milk, you can pay for food, you can pay for groceries. I think having like a, like a gift card company, like Bitcoin company makes it even much easier to live on a Bitcoin standard here, at least in Austin and Texas. But uh, to, to me, it's, it's just shocking to me that people are still taking dollars because if you, if you, if you've been around long enough, it, not even that long, like the, the, the sat to dollar ratio is mm-hmm. 10 times better than where it was like a year ago or, or, you know, even two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. So to me, it just makes absolutely no sense taking dollars instead of mm-hmm. Bitcoin because of the sat to dollar uh, parity. I don't know. They call me crazy. And I think it's just the lack of education and lack of fine. What's that thing they say? There's just a lack of uh, general finance education out there where people just don't know how um, yeah. finance works or how, how economics works. And, and to me, when, when I see that, it's just like, man, somebody should be educating these uh, Venezuelans or these Brazilians on why taking dollars is, is a dumb idea uh, when you could, could be convert, converting it to, to, to sats. Um, yeah. But, but that's me, but it, it, everybody has bills to pay and stuff, but that, that to me is just kind of wild to me when I see that. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting question. You know, I think, so, you know, I think a lot of Venezuelans have become crypto natives in a sense. They, they, and, and when I say crypto, I don't really mean like shit coins. I mean like cryptographic money, right? Like mm-hmm. they, they, uh, they know uh, crypto keys. They know crypto wallets. They, know, they, they, they have played with the technology. They, uh, they have an idea of the markets. Every Venezuelan is a financial sort of, it's more financially savvy than most people because they've had to like understand the dynamics of currency exchange, calculation of commissions, volatility, inflation. They understand a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. I think what it is is just like the water that they, like the, the, their fish in a, in a, in a, pe- in pestle water, right? The water around them is pesos. And so they think they, they look around and the, and the biggest ship that's stable, so to speak, right. 
the biggest, I mean, it's the messing up the metaphor, but basically they see the dollar, it's a big ship, and they see Bitcoin over here, and it's a little bit more wobbly, right? Even though it keeps growing, right? And so I think they sort of like played with Bitcoin. A lot of people, a lot of Venezuelans made a lot of money in Bitcoin, but then they also, they just uh, grab the dollar because it's steady, right? And that's how, and they feel safe that way, and they feel comfortable. But, but in America, the, the, the water is the dollar. And so that's the, that's the benchmark you're comparing. You're like, you're not going to go and analyze and calculate the benefits of investing in Venezuelan pesos or Colombian pesos or even Mexican pesos. Right. The Mexican pesos are very strong, but like even then it's like, ah, why, right? Yeah. And so your water is a dollar. And so the only thing you can compare it is against Bitcoin because that's really the only other thing in the game at that yeah, point. That makes sense. So I think it makes sense for, you to, for, for Americans to sort of be very focused on the collapse of the dollar. Whereas global South people are very focused on the collapse of the local currencies. Yeah, that, so that's they a, see the dollar as a stable. That's currency. a great point. Yeah, that's so they're focused on two, three, maybe two or three things as opposed to us Americans are focused just on the collapse of the dollar right. and hedging their bets early. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you for letting me see that. That's yeah, that's clear as day. Um, <laughs> cool. So uh, let's switch gears real quick. Um, let's talk about some developer stuff. I know you are you working out of the hacker garage in. Uh, over there or like, yeah, tell me about the, the scene over there and kind of what you're doing over there and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So Guadalajara school, I've, I've, I've been to Guadalajara. Uh, I've lived a couple of years there more here and there uh, over time. And um, there is like a growing community of very, very, very smart people led by Chris Guida, who's, you know, an old friend of mine. And, you know, you guys know him, you know, him. Yeah. Um, he's a contributor to Pleb Labs yeah. and, um, and yeah, he's just unstoppable and um, a true cypherpunk. And like, he's just getting shit done and coding and like, you know, just very focused. And he's teaching a few other locals to program Bitcoin and 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 do Bitcoin stuff. And then Supernet is, is, a is spending a lot of time in Golahar in this hacker garage. Um, I just spent uh, a month or two there, and uh, I learned a lot, and I and I I really like the work, the flow. I'm back in Colombia now, but um, I am that is one of my favorite cities in Mexico. I think it's it's great. It's it's a beautiful city. It's the third biggest city, but it, which means it's also like a small city, you know. And so there's not a lot of traffic. But there's lots of trees, you know. There's a lot of cool people, but it's not too crazy, right? So I, I really like Guadalajara. It's kind of a tech town as well. So, uh, and it's uh, a little bit further north, so it's get better to get to, has a great airport. So it's, I think it's a really good hub, like a, like a good potential hub for, for, uh, for Bitcoin to grow into. And, um, and yeah, so Chris Good is leading that. And I, I think it's, it's, it's very cool. I'm back in Colombia, but um, I, if, if I, I got a few projects that I'm playing with, if any of them materialize, I could see myself just moving back to Guadalajara and then working out of there because Again, like there's like a network effect now of talent, right? Like Super Testing will show up for weeks at a time and and he's brilliant, right? And and then Chris is like full time just coding and teaching people how to code and helping them solve Bitcoin software problems. So um and then the hacker garage crowd is really cool and they're very sharp and there's a lot of talent, diverse talent. Like I met this one kid who who just He's like 19 and he, he launched a video game and he got bought out by, by a publisher and it's now being published on Xbox, PlayStation, wow. and Nintendo. The kid's in 19. <laughs> he made his own video game. It's already like That's into amazing. the platform, right? Crush yeah, it. Dude, I'm, yeah. I'm so bullish, man. So bullish on uh, Mexico just in general. But it's good mm -hmm. to see uh, the Hacker Garage take shape. Um, I, I, I talked to Chris maybe last year. And he was talking about this thing, but I, I don't, I didn't know if he had launched it or not, but. Right. Well, he's good. got a bit devs now too. He's got. Oh, uh, wow. So it's, yeah, it's good. So he launched see. the Spanish bit devs out of Colorado. It's good to see that that scene is taking shape now. Um, need yeah. to get him on the pod at some point to, to talk yeah, about all it. this stuff. But um, yeah. Is there anything else that you have planned this year? What else? Are you going to Tapconf? I didn't even ask you. Are you going to Tapconf this year? I'd love to go. I mean, it's a bit of a long trip for me. Like if I could, if I could, if I could get find some way, way to make the costs work, you know, like, oh, it's just like a vacation for me. And I've had like three vacations this year. So <laughs> like, like, I think I, I want to go, but I haven't figured out like a really a, a good path to go yet, but um, we'll see what happens. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a few things up in the air right now that might, might settle it one way or another. Okay. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I really want to go to Austin. I really love Texas. I, I, yeah. I have, I'm trying to get like a little bit of real estate in Texas so I can have a place I can go and crash and have, Stay involved, you know. I think it's really cool, really cool place. 
Dude, if it's you fun. ever if you ever need a place in Austin, let me know. Like we we we've got the Club yeah. Lab network that we can uh, find you a spot for sure, hundred percent. That's what we do. We had awesome. some, we had yeah. some people stay here uh, for like a month, and we have a whole. It's weird how like once you start bringing more and more people, like all these different pockets open up, so you're able to people are coming in town, and then you just connect them to the right person, and then everything just kind of right. works out. It's 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 all organic. That's what I love about what's happened here in Austin. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 That sounds good. Is there uh, tell me a little bit about Bitcoin news? Cause I didn't even know too much about it other than um, I think one of, one of our writers here had written maybe a year ago over there. So tell me about Bitcoin news and like mm-hmm. where that's headed and how y'all di- differentiate between the other magazines and the other news outlets in the space. Right. Yeah. So Bitcoin news is a, a fairly new uh, media company in the space. They it's run by like a couple of guys, uh, and they have a small team and, um, uh, Rob is one of their, their, their main sort of content leads. Right. And, um, yeah, they're doing great stuff. I mean, their main vision is Bitcoin only Bitcoin first and, and Bitcoin maximalists. Right. And, and so they're, they're very strong, but they're very like approachable, you know, and, and they, they have really good memes on Twitter and they're, they're growing very fast, you know, and yeah. I think they differentiate themselves from, let's say, Bitcoin magazine and CoinDesk uh, in the sense that they don't talk, they don't, they don't praise or talk well about anything other than Bitcoin, right? Like they're not into ordinals they're not into like Ethereum, right? It's just Bitcoin. Right. And so I think it's a very strong brand. It's an important voice to have. And, um, you know, it's a startup, they're a small team, but, uh, I think they're, they're doing very good work. They're, they have a lot of talent. They do very good production work. So we did, we did a series of interviews kind of like the ones at Pleb Labs. We did a series like that in, yeah. in, um, in, in El Salvador and those got a lot of traction. We also interviewed um, Samson Mao right after he talked to the president of Colombia wow. about Bitcoin. And so I had that interview got, I think 50,000 views within wow. a couple of days, you know? So like, that's one product that we like, and they, they offer writing products for products for startups, right? So they'll, they, they can sell uh, PR and sort of, uh, you know, uh, branding and media uh, exposure packages, right? Uh, I think we can, we sort of, we can do conference coverage, like we, which is up level as we can go and do that at TapCal, for example, wow. and then just go with a couple of guys and interview everybody and get really good video stuff. And maybe that's my in, you know, if, if you know anybody at Pleb Labs, I think we could probably make that happen. Um, but yeah, they have, and they have like contributors uh, in various countries. So if I can't make it, maybe they have somebody else down there. Um, so they're just like a, you know, lean and mean media team. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they're very serious. They're very hardworking. Yeah. It's, it's incredible to see, because like you said, I mean, there's like Bitcoin magazine, but they seem to focus more on the, the, like there's, they're taking a different interest in the ecosystem and, uh, there's leaving, there's leaving this major wide gap right now where no one's yeah. covering just Bitcoin only news. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, they are to a certain extent, but they're not really. Um, and I think, you, I think, just from what I'm seeing, just a lot of people have left that company, uh, the, the magazine company, mm-hmm. a lot of great people that, that really made it that. So it's good right. to see that there's Bitcoin news out there. That's actually like, you know, really championing, uh, what the Bitcoin ethos is really about. And so that, that, that's very, if there's one thing that came out of this, this, this cycle was seeing you guys come out of nowhere and, really take that rain and, and kind of running with it. Cause it's desperately, it was desperately needed. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, they're cool. And, um, you know, we've, what we've done with them, like my relationship with them is we've partnered up on a, on a podcast that you can find at huangal.com or you can look up the huangal show on your favorite podcasting app. And, uh, that's led to like, I think maybe a hundred conversations with, founders, developers, uh, you know, influencers in the Bitcoin world talking about Bitcoin culture, right? So the reason I know, let's say a lot about the softworks is because I've interviewed a bunch of people about softworks, right? Yeah. And then, you know, I've had the art guys before, right? So it's, I love it because, you know, it's not like a big money maker. I think it's just like culture building, right? And community building. Um, but yeah, so we do this Twitter spaces and then we publish the feed on, on, on my, on my RSS feed and, uh, my, my podcast, the podcasting apps. And so, yeah, that's been, that's been fun and they're very supportive and they're, you know, they're just very consistent. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you're looking for some media 
some media airdrop, air support, uh, Bitcoin Magazine uh, can, can help a lot. Definitely, definitely reach out. Um, Sorry, Bitcoin News. <laughs> Bitcoin News can help a lot. <laughs> yeah, definitely reach out. Uh, yeah, appreciate that. And then I think th- I think that's all the questions I had for you today. I want to jump into like rapid fire where I ask sure. really fast questions at the end and then uh, we can end off there. But uh, yeah, if right. you, you okay with that? Answering some yeah, really, really quick questions. Yeah. All right. First question is, uh, what's your, who's your favorite writer or what's your favorite book of all time? Is there like one or two that you can Man, think that's of? A great question. Like who, who, inspi- mean, who inspired you to write one? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I, I'm going to have to say Ayn Rand, um, for obvious reasons, but you know, like she, she, I don't think she was a great philosopher. You know, I don't think she was actually that great of a philosopher, but I do think she was a great writer. Um, I think, uh, Ada Shrug had just incredible, uh, metaphors that still to my, to this day, like I remember the, what the visuals that they evoked in me. Right. And, and I really like that. Um, I think, yeah. So I would say Ayn Rand is really good, uh, writer and, you know, I don't really, I don't really read that much, you know, like I consume a lot more podcasts than I read. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say she was, she was pretty strong, uh, influence on me. Yeah. Okay. Second question. What do you, what does Juan like doing with his spare time outside of Bitcoin, outside of writing, outside of any type of like, uh, professional things that you have to do for your job or if that's okay if that's part of your regular life too mm-hmm. but like what do you where do you where do you go to find your peace of mind and to get back to center right i i like video games um, really yeah what I, game are you I, playing i, I do uh, i just got back into Baldur gate three um if you've heard of that one it's like dungeons and dragons but you know software version and it's like incredibly well made um so i'm, I'm getting back into that game um, I try not to game too much. I, I kind of like gaming a little bit too much, but uh, lately I've been spending a lot of time building like a, like a, like a, I have like a programming project where I'm building an RPG with AI stuff. And, wow. um, and so I've been like trying to create an RPG and, 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 you know, going back to Baldur's Gate cause they just implemented it so well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do a little bit of gaming. I love listening to like a podcast and just, or playing chess. I'm really into chess. So like just podcast and chess, I can do that for hours. Uh, so maybe yeah. we'll see an Atlas Shrug video game coming from you at some point. That'd be fun. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> <RPG>. idea. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. All right. The, the, the last question is, uh, if there's one thing that you kind of have, if there's one thing in Bitcoin that you hope that we get over the goal line, and whatever you want, whatever that is, it doesn't, it, it could be anything from whether it's price or whether it's something here or, or it could be a company or like whatever it is. If there's one thing that you hope that you see in your lifetime when it comes to Bitcoin, yeah, that, that we get it over the goal line, what would it, what it is, what is it and what would it be? Yeah, I think, I think it would probably be the great script restoration by Rusty. Um, I think, I think if we could get that over the, over the finish line and get it, get it in. I think you would see an incredible technology boom in Bitcoin. Um, I think a lot of the crypto shitcoin people, they're, they're not bad people. They're just pragmatists. They're not ideologues. They're just, they're, they're builders in their own right, but they just don't find enough tools and it's too hard to do Bitcoin development. I mean, I think anybody that's done Bitcoin development realizes how convoluted the tools are, you know, like super will tell you like the, you know, half of Bitcoin development is like encoding cryptography into different encoding things or something like that. So like if we can just give them better dev tools at a core level, um, I think and, and better if we could have better better scripting in Bitcoin, I think you would see a huge boon. I wouldn't worry about the shitcoins because the shitcoins have been on top of Bitcoin since they wanted, right? Counterparty would let you let has been letting you create shitcoins on top of Bitcoin since before Ethereum, right? Like color coins were created in Bitcoin. You can go and mint shitcoins on Bitcoin now. Like, it's not an issue. Nobody can stop it. Ordinals happen despite the concerns of Luke Jr. and, and, and that whole crowd. Who I'm a fan of as well. They're good people. But, like, you know, like, people are going to shitcoin. This thing is a casino. You know, Bitcoin is the only real thing in the casino. Bitcoin is the gold that you that you go to the casino and, tr- and gamble with, right? And then you cash out the gold and you leave, right? Like, that's just the accept that, you know, I think we need to accept that reality, you know, 
and then like give, get better scripting into Bitcoin, I think will be will be a big boom for for everybody involved, for the lightning speed lightning people, for the payments people, for the self custody people. Yeah, I would love to see that.